everyone, and welcome to our book trip live chat with New York Times bestselling author Andrew Gross. Andrew is here today to chat with us about his newest thriller, Everything to Lose. We want to remind everyone that after the chat, you can enter or win a copy of the book on Book Trip. And Andrew, um, I can see there's a lot of great questions coming through, but before we get to those, I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind telling us just a little bit about Everything to Lose for those who um, aren't familiar yet. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a thriller. That's what I do. It uh, centers around the question, how far would you go to protect your own kids? Would you even do something criminal? And it, um, Hillary Cantor is the main character, and she's a devoted, dedicated mom with a kid with Asperger's syndrome, with a, you know, big job and, and you know, seemingly everything going right, um, or the kid in a special school, although you know, it's hard to get through every month. Uh, and then disaster hits her. She loses her job. Her deadbeat husband turns off all the, with all the support. And now she can't even pay the tuition for her kid's school. And uh, um, she uh, basically goes into free fall and she's driving along a country road. Uh, she's actually going to go to her ex-husband and in, in beg. And she, uh, the car in front of her swerves and goes off the road. And as she goes down to investigate um the guy is dead and she you know he's unresponsive but on the seat next to him is a bag and what's in the bag but uh, neatly wrapped hundred dollar bills five hundred thousand dollars so the question is what do you do in that situation this is the kind of thing that can knit her life back together she knows it's illicit money that's clear um she doesn't take it at first she actually zips up the bag and throws it into the woods um, but then as her life becomes even more dire and she becomes more desperate, she goes back and of course she takes it. It's a thriller. So she has to take it. And when she does, it brings about a wave of uh, unforeseen uh, and ugly consequences. It's fantastic. Everyone who hasn't read it needs to check it out and enter to win on Book Trip if you haven't. Um, okay. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering... Um, the current question um, someone has asked, people mis make mistakes and the story starts with the idea that every life is the story of a mistake and what you do afterwards. What uh, drew you to this theme and why did you what did you find so um, compelling about it to write about it? Yeah, I think um, a lot of my books deal with this issue. Um, I guess, as you said, the question, the, the first line of this book is it said that every life is a story of a single mistake. And all my characters make mistakes because most bad things that happen in life are are sins of omission, not even commission. And, you know, in, a, in, a, in, in any decision, you can go two ways down a path. And a lot of my characters, uh, whether intentionally or unintentionally, step down the wrong path. And it's just a small step that sends them over the edge um, into a situation that brings, you know, dire stuff and peril. Um, so I like that idea. I like the idea of randomness affecting um, outcome. Um, and I like the idea that uh, we all have, I mean, you know, frankly, everything in my life that, bless you, whoever that was, uh, um, everything in my life that I can sort of attribute to, certainly the good stuff, all sort of happened in an unintended way for me. So I just like this sort of concept that, uh, you know, these, it, it's not just a mistake, it's also what you do after. A mistake doesn't go anywhere if you sort of own up to it, but most people don't. And certainly in the kind of situations I write about, people don't, and that's what brings with it the wave of results that hits my character. Great. Um, Emma is wondering, you are one of the few male writers who um, knows how to write in a female voice and well. Do you think your ability to think outside the box is a contributing factor to the success of your novels? I think it's really because I'm a cross-dresser and I really sort of <laughs> nail the whole female character thing down. I don't know what it is. I always get asked that. And I, I, I actually was forced to write in a female character on this book. The original proposal that I put together was a male and my publisher forced me into it, which is not a simple thing. It's not just changing a pronoun in a book. It's changing a million things in terms of how a character behaves, especially in a thriller. You know, are they, are they, you know, are they physically able to match up with their opponent or do they have to sort of outguile them? Um, if they have a kid, you know, a, a father somehow can disappear for a while while he's out thrillering. But a, a woman, if she does that, she's committing a sin that's even worse than what she might do because then she's a bad mother and you need sympathy. So 
you know, it's it's very it was it's it was a difficult transition. But I've always been able to write in that voice, and maybe some of it is that I like my books to have an emotional payoff at the end of them. And it's possibly easier to do that through a female lens than through a male lens. And I like to go for that in my books. So to some degree, I'm comfortable doing it. It might also be that I have always grown up around sort of strong-willed women. And I was in the clothing business for many, many years, which is populated by strong-willed women. So in any case, I guess I like, I like the personality archetype, um, feel comfortable in it. And I think there's something sexy about women um, acting heroically uh, against men or against forces that are larger than them. Um, so anyway, I guess, you know, to, to whatever degree, I seem to be able to do it well. And as I think I've probably said in various times in the past, doing that got me into, got me to James Patterson that sort of launched my, my own career. So um, um, I think, I think for whatever reason, it's become a signature of my books. Definitely. And Riley is wondering, um, you come out with a new novel each year. How much pressure do you feel to publish, or are you pretty self-motivated to bang it out? Um, well, you guys go into work every day, don't you? I mean, um, I, I think that self-motivation is overplayed. Um, I get paid to do this, and um, I think I would, you know, I'm not sure if I would come out with a book a year if I wasn't paid for it, but this is how we earn our living, and you know, in my own view, the imagination is endless enough that it expands to your need for money. So, so I, I, I somehow managed to bring a book out every year. Uh, just about everybody in our trade does it, and many people bring out two. I'm sort of in one of these little niches where I'm pretty well paid, and I'm pretty well paid enough to enjoy the flexibility that comes in our life, which I value. But there are people, I guess, that are paid less that need to bring out more, more work in order just to make a go of it. And then there are people that are paid multi, multi millions and they're doing it for obvious reasons, you know, as I would. So I'm just in this kind of tight little niche that allows me to bring out one. And no, I don't really feel, I mean, I deliver my books on time and I, I actually, I respond to pressure to be honest with you. I sort of like deadlines and I like, um, you know, I, I like the, the you know, I, I, whenever it is, what, to me, it sort of um, um, marinates the creative juices uh, probably better than if there was no time pressure. Shane is wondering, how much research did you have to do in order to portray Brandon, Hillary's autistic son, in the most accurate way? That is a good question. Um, somehow today, whether online or at the event I did before or now, um, this is about the third or fourth question that's come up related to Brandon, who's the kid with Asperger's, who is basically a highly functioning kid with Asperger's. Um, I can't say I did immense research. Search. The thing is, is that we know a couple of kids like that. So I've seen how they behave just personally. Um, and I didn't want him to be so troublesome that he sort of had to be restrained in some way. I, I wanted him to be semi-functioning because he does, in many ways, perform his own heroic uh, um, uh, role in this book. Um, and I wanted him to have a relationship uh, with the mom that people could identify with as a mother-son relationship. Um, so in any case, but, but clearly he's a kid that goes between um, responsiveness and willfulness. And, so, you know, it, it's, it, it did require some, but a lot of them were just firsthand observations. Great. Um, Chelsea's uh, wondering, um, do you get uh, used to, um, I'm sorry, do you get the, you used to write with James Patterson question a lot. How much of an influence was he when it came to telling your stories? I'm getting it less and less, which is purely uh, very satisfying to me. Um, you know, when you work with Jim, um, Said delicately, um, there are there 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 there's uh, things that come from it that uh, um, aren't altogether what how I would like people to view my own work. I mean, you know, I, I don't write Patterson clones, and yet for the several for the first several books I've written, I don't think I ever got a review where it wasn't you know Andrew Gross who cut his bones with his teeth with Jim Patterson or X Patterson which comes with a typecast that basically you're in this only to turn pages that your characters are 
cursorily drawn, and and that uh, um, you know that 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 there's just not the kind of detail that's that's spent on on the book in any way because your main interest is turning pages. And while there were things that I drew from Patterson that I think any writer should, um, I'll name a couple. Uh, one, I really do believe in pace. Um, ironically, I think this book is my least pacey book, and I think that's why I'm getting the best reviews I've ever gotten. Um, because sometimes when you go for pace too much, it convinces someone right off the bat that that's what you're going for, and you're not going for anything of depth in the book. And I, I think to some degree I've been misjudged in a lot of my books because it's just easy to typecast them that way. So pace is one, uh, but there's a lot of different ways to achieve pace. Um, one of the ways, of course, are the short chapters that sort of are these interl interlinking dramatic chapters that everyone identifies with Patterson, which, by the way, just about everyone in commercial fiction is using today, uh, or, in, or in, 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 in thriller fiction. Um, and um, the other thing is point of view. Uh, I have actually uh, taught classes in point of view. I'm doing one for Thriller Fest right now that's online. And I really believe that the model point of view for a thriller is what I picked up from Patterson, which I think he was first to sort of create because before that it was all looked at as a taboo, which is you want the immediacy of a first person connection with your narrator, which is great because it builds that bond with the reader and it gets the, you know, it lets you, uh, uh, to, it enables you to create a sense of voice um, that someone's comfortable with at the same time you absolutely want to be in the head of who else? Your bad guy and your victims. Victims in order to give dimension to the kinds of bad acts that are taking place so you can feel sympathy and you don't have to go, you, got, you, know, you can go anywhere in literature, whether it's Shakespeare or the Bible or Milton's Paradise Lost or a million places where the energy of the villain, of the bad guy is the strongest energy in the book. So why shouldn't you be in that person's head? So this combination, first and third person, hero and first, villains and, and maybe uh, um, 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 victims in third, is to me the model structure to write uh, a thriller in. And then the last thing on it is basically, um, I, I really have picked up also investing your reader and the plight of your hero within the first 10 pages. It's a very important thing for me. I learned it with Jim. We might do it in different ways, but I really think it's important to do as a prospective writer because um, not just to sell your book, I mean, you know, but basically everybody has a million choices to make with their, with their time in terms of what they get into. And I want my reader invested in that plight. I want my reader invested in my hero immediately, whether I put them in peril or not. Um, and it's, it's not easy to do, but it certainly is doable. So, I'm really not a believer in the kind of character where you really don't know if you want to take the ride with them. And then over, let's say, uh, 100, 200 pages, they sort of change in their arc of character and you get to know them and like them and want to be with them. I basically want you on board from the start. I want you rooting for that character from the start. Some great advice for aspiring writers. Um, Alex is wondering, what does MacGuffin mean? Uh, you use the term MacGuffins when describing how to construct a thriller. Well, I can't say I use it, to be honest with you. Um, my, my buddy who passed away recently, Michael Palmer, used to use it. And if, if you uh, get your hands on everything to lose, you'll see in the acknowledgments who it's dedicated to. And it's to Michael. And Michael was one who used the Hitchcock's concept of a MacGuffin that really is the sort of short overriding theme that a, that, a, that, that a book is built on, that a thriller idea is on. It's the catch of it. It's sort of that, you know, 60 second bullet point that you would describe your book. Um, and Michael always sort of looked at it that way. To me, to be totally frank, um, my books, I sort of think of as a triangulation of three or four things. I mentioned a little bit of what this book is about, but that's only really a part of it. It's also about um, CU kids, CU standing for callous and unemotional, which behavioralists think today is sort of the building block of, of children who grow into psychopaths. It's that, it's that immureness um, or, or iciness to either tragedy or violence or the lack of sympathy. And this is a theme in the book too, 
um, um, as well as a 20-year-old murder that took place on Staten Island um, that, that um, has to be answered. And then lastly is the subject of Hurricane Sandy. It, it, that happened coincident with my planning of the book. And because there was a Staten Island theme where a murder took place in the book, I thought I had to weave it in. And more than just a setting or a backdrop, the storm actually becomes a character in this book. It plays a key role in the book. And all the characters are reeling from it in, to some degree. So I, I can't, I don't really like these elevator pitches, if, if that's the right way to look at it. I really think that these sort of three or four themes married together is how at least I construct the thrill. Okay, great. Um, Tammy Bryant is asking, hi, Andy, good to see you again. How far would you go uh, for your kids and Lynn? Well, I wouldn't do something criminal. I mean, I just sort of let them, what happens, happens, you know, they get themselves in a situation like that you know they're they're adults now um <laughs> I, I i would definitely be taking that money um I'm, sadly this probably speaks to character maybe it was my time in the garment business i probably would be taking it even if the situation wasn't totally dire um i don't know you know um i i, I i'm a decent enough dad that i think i would go to the mat for my kids and uh, now my wife is another issue i have to think about that <laughs> um Cynthia. Cynthia Blaine is wondering, after what you have learned from writing with another author, how do you feel that you will be, um, do you feel that you will be apt to write with anyone else anytime soon? I've read or listened to all of your co-authored books and prefer all the ones written exclusively by you, actually. Looking forward to reading Everything to Lose. That's a great compliment. That's very sweet. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I always say that every writer wants to be a co-writer, but we really, we all want to be management, not labor. So I would definitely do it uh, if the demand is there, and uh, I'm not sure it is right now, um, but, but I would do it on my terms. Now, I, I don't think I'll be doing it again. I certainly hope I'm not doing it again on someone else's terms. Um, but the key is to write, and, and a, lot of people are, a lot of people are doing this, so it opens the door to a lot of people for opportunities. I know a number of writers who are now taking, taking co-writing roles, uh, a number of people that publish every year. The real trick is to find a way to leverage this into a solo career for yourself. And I, and I think that said, I don't know if I'm the only one that has sort of done it on a certain level, but it's not a long list. I, I actually can't think of anyone else there. I'm sure someone would correct me, but I, so, so it's not the easiest thing. It's not an automatic thing to use a byline on a book and leverage yourself into your into your own career, but it's writing, and and um, you know I'm it, I, I think it's happening more and more. So, uh, but in my case, um, uh, like I said, I think the only way I would probably go back to it, I hope, is uh, if um, if it's my book and I have the copyright, I retain the copyright rights. So. DC is asking, um, I don't mind a female lead in a thriller, but why does there have to be what I'm, I'm thinking is a romance ro romance element? Hillary connects to a determined cop. Why does there have to be? Um, well, one, um, I thought people like romance. Gee, who, who asked that question? Uh, DC. DC, like what motivates you in life? Uh, uh, I think people like that, um, but but this will make you happy. It's not a, uh, it's it's a connection. It's not a uh, slobbering romance. So you'll be very happy to hear that. Um, um, but they're two people that create a connection to each other, which I think is a virtue in a book. I think people like that. Um, I think people like sex in a book. Um, I think people um, like to see um, people forming a relationship around something that is, is, is basically, you know, a life-threatening event. Um, um, so, so, you know, the reason we like to write them is because I think generally people like to read them, unless I'm totally misjudging everything. <laughs> Amy's wondering, what does your family think about your books? Do they read them and have they ever had a negative thing to say about them? Is that thing or th things? How many negative things do they have to say about them? Um, my, you know, of course, my wife reads them generally early on because 
because she's a convenient first reader, as a lot of spouses are. Um, my wife is a very literal reader, and over the you know bunch of books I did with Patterson, and the, 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 this is now the eighth book I've done on my own, she knows what I'm going for. And so it's very easy to sort of bounce what I do off of her and just get the sense, is it suspenseful? Is it funny? Is it romantic? Sorry, DC. Is it, uh, um, you know, I mean, you know, is, is what I'm going for achieved? Um, the, my kids, I have two, two uh, boys and a girl. My daughter um, can't wait to get her hands on my books and always reads them when they're in uh, uh, reader copy form, advanced copy form. Um, I'm not sure if my boys have ever read one of my book, and that sort of relates to the whole issue of who's reading today and who isn't. They all say they do or have, but um, I, I guess I could sort of grill them on plot details, and I think I would win that bet. Uh, <laughs> and they're in their they're in their twenties, so you know they can read, um, but um, I'm not sure they've even read one. I'm still trying to push the blue zone on my boys. I, I, you'd like it. It's a, you a girl. It's almost your age. You know? <laughs> uh, Riley is wondering, your last few books um, had happy endings. This one, not so much. It was a bit dark, but I liked it. Uh, did you think you made the right decision to end it the way it did without giving spoilers? Good, right. I, I, I'll try to answer it very vaguely, I guess. Um, <laughs> not everyone you want to see perish perishes. And I, um, you're right, my last couple of books ended almost like a Shakespearean comedy. It's not, there's disorder in the world, but it's brought together at the end. You know, order is restored in the kingdom. And, and um, I never really wanted a silly sanguine, sanguine e ending, but I, I, I like the fact that books end on an emotional um, um, tenor. And, and to some degree, it's easy when, um, when, when, you know, people get together who you want to see get together. And this one, everybody was flawed in this book. Everybody had something to hide. Everybody had done something bad. And I think it was important. Um, there goes my doggy behind me. Uh, I think it was important to make them pay. And um, maybe I made someone pay too much. Who knows? But uh, I, I think it was the right tone for the ending. I think if nothing else, it sort of put aside some of the more um, happy endings, I guess, as you describe it, that I've done in the past and, and, and get it, you know, it, it sort of gives the book a little gravity, um, earned gravity that it might not have if everything just ended in a smooth way. But, you know, it's funny, I, I, a couple of reviewers said that this is my darkest book. And I don't really see it that way. Um, I, I wrote a book about teenage suicide and Charles Manson or a Charles Manson like character. So I don't know what could be much darker than that. <laughs> and, and, you know, this one to me is, is like the same level of darkness as most of my books. The only thing that might separate it is the ending. So it was good to acknowledge that. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't remember your name. It was a good point to acknowledge it. I think I hit the right tone. I think people who read it seem to be happy. I mean, you know, my reviews have been by far the best that I've ever had before, which, which surprised me because the truth is it wasn't, it was a book that fought me all the way through it. It was an idea that fought me. It was an idea that I had to sell hard to Harper Collins. And I really wasn't sure what I had. I was sort of worried that maybe it wasn't quite on the same level of what I've done. And uh, by far, by, by a multiple of five, I'm, I've always get good reviews, but the kinds of responses I'm getting are just way beyond what I'm used to. So and I think got, some of that was. Hmm? And you got okay. word that it's a bestseller as well. Yes, I just got word last night that it's landed on the New York Times list. It's the first, It's uh, it's been three books since I had one happen that way. So I'm delighted to be back in the club, so to speak. Yes. Fantastic. Benny is uh, wondering, has there been any interest in making one or more of your books into a movie or television series? And if, would uh, you who, do it? Who, who, who is that? Uh, Benny. Benny, Benny. Um, um, well, let me answer the second part as succinctly as I can. Yes. Um, the first part, um, uh, Benny, thank you for turning the knife in my back. I'm going to just turn around and pull it out because uh, my last book, No Way Back, was sold to through Imagine, 
you know, Ron Howard's company, Imagine, to ABC for a lot of money, not much of which that drifted to me, but a, a lot of money. And um, they actually rejected the script a couple of weeks ago. So um, it's not going to be made there. So uh, I, I'm sure it'll try to be remarketed. But um, we sort of thought that was a slam dunk because of the amount of money they paid. So they didn't reject my book. They love my book. That they uh, I, I didn't love the script so much either. So I'm not completely surprised at the outcome. So, but the answer is sure. Everybody wants that um, for obvious reasons. Uh, you know, movies are really hard right now. Thrillers, especially. I don't really write policey thrillers, but especially that market has been totally ceded to television. Um, and, but most of it has been. I mean, it's very hard to get a thriller done into a movie now. Um, you know, you really need an advocate to take it through the process and get it financed and made. And, you know, be best would be someone like Brad Pitt, who signs on to it, loves it and buys it, you know, that kind of thing. But it's rare. So it's really a TV you know, play at this point. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, never know. well, you know, you never know. <laughs> um, Graham wants to know what's your favorite show on TV these days. Um, I think it's it's going back to uh, Game of Thrones. Um, I, I I I loved. Um, um, oh golly, what's the political one? Uh, game with, with Kevin Spacey. Uh, thank you. The voice from. My wife is eavesdropping, so I don't say something crummy about her. Uh, um, House of Cards. I love first season one, and I'm sort of getting bored to death as I watch along season two. Um, you know, um, let's see. I'm trying to think what, uh, what you know, what else. Uh, it, it, we go in and out on things, you know. Um, but but uh, I'm not a Mad Men fan. I'm, I'm not a Breaking Bad fan. Some shows are dark for me. Um, but, you know, actually, embarrassingly, I like The Voice. I really like watching The Voice. Sure. I think it's like a perfect pitch show. And, and we haven't seen it in a week or two. And I don't even, I'm not up to date on it. But I, my wife got me into it last year. And I was rooting for the Jamaican gal, Tessa. So I, I was never sort of into it. And I think American Idol is, is moronic. And, but somehow I got into the show rooting for the gal. So I, I was totally invested. So I even watch it this year. You know. I find it very hard to, uh, um, um, I don't even do a lot of reading when I'm intensively writing because my brain just gets fried uh, by the end of the day. So I really sort of, I'm willing to watch as much dippy television. I, I don't know if this goes against the sense of gravity I was trying to create for myself a moment ago, but I, I will watch as much dippy television as there is programming and, you know, or sports. Um, and basically, I'm just trying to recharge and cool the jets like anyone would, and uh, vodka or two helps, too. <laughs> there we go. Um, mm -hmm. Ariel says, uh, while you're writing a novel, do you avoid reading other people's books during that period? I know some people are cautious to do this, so they aren't mimicking or being influenced by others. No, that's not my reason. I mean, I'm constantly reading in some way. It's, it's, that's not my reason at all. Um, I think I have a strong sense of, well, I was about to say, I think I have a strong sense of my voice. And maybe if somebody asks me a question about that, I'll pick up on that because I have an interesting response to that question that wasn't asked. But, but I don't really worry about migration of voice or, or that sort of thing. It's just literally really, really hard after you're, you're working all day. You know, it's an intense thing to be writing. And, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, I just don't find it relaxing to move into a, a book now you know when i go away i'm actually leaving in an hour or two or something you know i'm i'm a constant reader and you know i'll digest you know you know four books in a vacation week but but um it, it's it's hard i i i just find it it's not it's not a replenishing thing to me to spend the evening reading and i do most of my writing during the day so so um but it's not at all because of the voice session Mm, that makes sense. Um, Michael is wondering, at what point do you think uh, you'll be like, okay, I've had enough writing, no more books for me? Will you ever get to that point? Um, <laughs> only we never want you to, so don't stop. <laughs> only if they stop paying me, Michael. Um, you know, the good thing about writing is you, you know, hopefully the imagination stays nascent for long enough that you can do it uh, indefinitely. 
Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to, I have other books I want to write other than just thrillers. I, I may do, an, I, the next book I'm doing is a Ty Houck book. I don't know if I'm asking somebody else's question. Those usually pop up, but um, I've, I've always had this, you know, hue and cry to when are you going to do Ty again? When are you going to do Ty again? Um, I've done three books in this character for those who may not know. Um, and the next book I'm doing is a Ty Houck book, but it's not based in Connecticut. Pardon me, it's based in Colorado, and he gets involved in a fight between um, farmers and oil companies over, well, not just over fracking, but over over the water that's needed for fracking and the stealing of water rights, which in drought droughts are driving the farmers out of their livelihood. So it's really a small guy against a big corporation thing, which is sort of perfect material for Ty Houck. Uh, so it's really a modern day Western. And, and But after that, I'm, I think I'm gonna write a book that's set in World War II. I have an interesting concept for that. And uh, there's a couple of other things I'd like to write. I certainly would like to set one starting in the 30s or 40s, 40s in the garment business, which was a really sort of uh, mafia um, 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 challenged business back then, even the Jewish mafia, which you know, I don't know how many people know it, but was by far the most violent and bloodthirsty. You know, we made the Italians look uh, like a pizza, you know, mild. We, we were tough little guys who, you know, murder incorporated, but uh, they controlled in many ways the garment business. And I sort of like that setting because my family was in it and I was in it for a stage. Um, so I may do some books in that area. And, and uh, I, I loved writing The Jester with Jim Patterson. Uh, which took place in the 11th century, and I have a very interesting follow-up concept, if anyone would ever want it, that would take place maybe 100 years after that. And But I, I like writing historical. I certainly like reading them. So. But I fully intend to be paid to write for quite some time, I hope. We look forward to reading your future books. Um, well, that's about all the time uh, we have for today. I know you have to run, um, but thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And thank you to all of our viewers. And we want to remind everyone um, that you can enter to win a copy of uh, the book on Book Trip. And if you don't win, go out and buy it. Um, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Okay. Thanks, guys. So long, everyone. Take care.